Well, Daniel chapter 11, we just come to a, I don't know, maybe four or five messages left. And we find ourselves in Daniel 11, verses 10 through 20. I think I'll wait on the reading. We'll read that as we proceed ahead. We'll cover those 10 verses today. But really, Daniel 11, you remember we touched on once before, gives us a sweep of nearly 200 years in the future, okay? All the way to the second coming of Christ in chapter 12 and the setting up of his earthly kingdom. And what we're gonna find in Daniel chapter 11 is the precision of the word of God is absolutely amazing. I, I say it this way because as we read through and exposit Daniel 11, 10 through 20, we're going to be reading about some crazy history, but it's contained in the Word of God. And what makes it amazing is understand that as we read it today, we're going to look back and see it as prophecy that's been fulfilled and yet when Daniel penned this, he was pinning it with a future in view of about 200 years prior to these events. So it would be like a prophet today, there is no more prophets, writing in the year 2624 and telling you about all the kingdoms of the world and naming them, if you will, and telling you what's going to happen and telling you what's going to be lifted up and what will be put down. So as we read history here, it's history to us. But as you will, if you look down in chapter 11, beginning at verse 36, that's going to describe the future. So 1 through 20 is, and, and even 35 is history, but when we get to 36, uh, down through 45, that is the future, and we believe that will deal with the Antichrist. Now, because this text is so amazing, and there's so many prophecies that were fulfilled in it, he writes, and then they all come to pass, it's also one of the most attacked chapters in all of the Bible because of the accuracy of the prophecies stated in Daniel 11. Liberals and even unbelievers can't fathom that God gave such detailed information to a prophet hundreds of years before the events, but that is exactly what Daniel writes. In fact, one said that just in chapter 11 alone, there are 38 fulfilled prophecies in this chapter. Now, as you read this, you want to hold on to it because whatever we look back and whatever God has said in the past that now becomes his story, it's a great encouragement to us that all future prophecies will, will take place exactly as they are described. Now, let me just set the context for you. It's been, well, a couple weeks because of KC preaching and, and then Mother's Day is that 10 through 12 is one unit of revelation, okay? Chapter 10 introduced the vision. Do you remember where Daniel was brought into a cosmic battle and he had this vision and he was waiting for it to be described. And it took the angels, uh, both we think Gabriel and then Michael the archangel, to finally get to him because Michael was delayed in coming to him because he was in a cosmic battle. In fact, look back at chapter 10. Um, in fact, in 10.1, it talks about Belteshazzar and the word was true and it was of a great conflict. And then he said in 10.18, again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, oh man, greatly loved. 
fear not. Peace be with you in verse 19. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. In other words, he had this vision, but it wasn't explained to him because of this cosmic battle. Michael breaks through and he begins to explain that vision to him. And that's what we have in chapter 11. If chapter 10 was the introduction of the vision, chapter 11 is the content of the angel's vision. Now, just a framework, and then we're going to dive in, and I'm going to try to fly high here, okay? Chapter 11 divides into two sections, okay? You can read this on your own. Uh, 11 and then verse 2 through 35 describes, in essence, two warring kingdoms of the Persian and the Greek Empire. The prophecies in 2 through verse 35 have already been fulfilled. Roughly 200 years as he penned them, they came true. And we can look back and they came true exactly. Chapter 11 is the battle between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. And it's in the word of God, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle it. In fact, most people, uh, I would say, most preachers just skip over Daniel 11. But Brian and I can't do that. We're we're expositors. But I'm going to fly high. The reason we find the kings of the north, which would be the Seleucid Empire, and the kings of the south, that would be Ptolemies, or down south in Egypt, is because... They are sandwiched right in between the land of Israel. Would you glance down in chapter 11, verse 16? It says, but he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him, speaking of Antiochus the Great, and he shall stand in the glorious land. The glorious land is Israel. In fact, I think I'll bring that picture back up. I think it should come up. There it is. Do you see there kind of to the northeast is the Seleucid Empire, okay? This is a time, a map of the Bible times. Down south is the Ptolemaic Empire. You could see that's the region of Egypt today, the Ptolemaic Empire, Egypt in that day. If you look Right above the Ptolemaic Empire is the land of Jerusalem. So whenever we talk about the kings of the north and the kings of the south warring against each other, Jerusalem becomes the land bridge for all the wars. And I think that's why it's the center of all history. And what chapter 11 does is go into amazing detail. You say, well, what's chapter 11 about? It is a phenomenal, intriguing, prophetic soap opera. It's the best way to say it, okay? It's filled with war, with murder, with immorality, greed, and the nation of Israel and the Jewish people are caught right in the middle of all of it. And they're either occupied by the Seleucid Empire or they're occupied briefly by the southern, uh, you know, country of Egypt. They're right there in the middle of it all. Now, remember we said a couple weeks ago, the best way to outline this, I thought, is just to describe as he's pinning prophecy, five kings that will come. So I'm going to put it that way rather than Ptolemaic and Seleucid and so forth. Five kings, Ahasuerus, another name was Xerxes, but I'll put him here. His other name was Ahasuerus. Alexander the Great, secondly, Antiochus the Great, thirdly, and then Antiochus Epiphanes was the fourth king, and the future king, the fifth king, in the future is the Antichrist. So what we're talking about today has great relevance 
for this nation and the future of our world. Now, we looked at the first two. We looked first at Ahasuerus in verse 2. Look there in 11.2. And now I will show you the truth, the angels telling Daniel. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. That was Ahasuerus. You say, well, what do I need to know about that? Well, I just want you to know Daniel penned this hundreds of years before it happened. He talked about three kings coming, three kings came. Then he talked about a fourth king and the fourth king, Ahasuerus, who's found in Esther 1, named Xerxes, interchangeably, he was raised up. This is an incredible prophecy. He was very wealthy, okay? But as quick as he came up, look at the text in three, then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. Well, you remember in the statue that was presented earlier, the the gold, if you will, was replaced here by uh, then Persia, then came Greece, and it was Alexander the Great. Now, it doesn't name him here, but we know that to be exactly what happened. He will rule with great dominion, and it says that he will do as he wills. Greece back in that picture was the bronze and the statue. It was also the leopard later in Daniel, and also the male goat. So here he's prophesying what's going to happen hundreds of years before it took place. There's going to be a Hashuerus. He's going to rule. He's going to follow that line of the Persian kings. Then a, a great king is going to come, and it's Alexander. And then you say, well, what happens to him? Well, look there. It says in verse Four, and as soon as he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds. This is exactly what happened. Remember, he died, we believe, an alcoholic at the age of 33. This is known history, looking back. And who would lead that great kingdom of Greece? Well, he was such a brilliant military leader that no one person can lead it. And so history tells us, looking back, it went and was divided into the four winds of heaven. And that's exactly what happened. Whatever the angel told Daniel and Daniel penned is exactly what happened. After Alexander the Great, it led to the four generals that led the Grecian kingdom. Cassander took Macedonia and Greece, if you will. Lysimachus took Thrace and Asia Minor. Ptolemy, here's where we're coming, took Egypt to the south and Seleucus took Syria to the north. Now these latter two kingdoms, Ptolemy and Seleucus, or the Egyptian part, and then the Syrian part, become what the rest of Daniel actually focuses on. And understand as I walk you through these battles, through this soap opera, I'll give you some history. I'll fly high, I will do my best, but Israel's right in the middle of them. And listen, they're right in the middle of it today, are they not? Whatever you saw on that map is exactly what's taking place in the power struggles of the day and Israel is right in the center of it. Anti, the Antiochus the Great is going to take uh, that Seleucid Empire right down to Gaza, which is right the, the linchpin of where this battle is right now with Israel and Hamas. So when we look back, we see all of this, and maybe some of you remember this in history, but I'm telling you that Daniel, by way of the angel, prophesied this 100 year, 200 years nearly before it took place. So I take you from Ahasuerus, here's our focus, to Alexander the Great. Thirdly, the third A is to Antiochus the Great. Antiochus the Great. Look at verse 9. It says, then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south. 
but shall return to his own land. Here, in 240 BC, Seleucus, the king of the north, invaded Egypt. But it says in verse 9, he returned defeated. And as he returned defeated, his two sons, Seleucus III, and you can do your best with the names, and Antiochus III, Antiochus the Great, Antiochus the Third is Antiochus the Great, they rose to recover what their father had lost. And so Antiochus the Great becomes the focus in verses 10 through 20. Now what the text is going to do, as I'll just put it this way, is trace five fulfilled prophecies in the kings of the north and in the kings of the south so that, here's the purpose, okay, so that it would demonstrate God's sovereign control over all history and the amazing accuracy of the word of God. So as we walk through this, thank you for being noble Bereans, but it's gonna demonstrate that he was in control then. He's in control now. You say, well, I don't, who's gonna win? Uh, Biden or Trump? Well, we don't know. That's going to happen in November, but I could be, we're assured of this, that God Almighty rules, amen? He's in perfect control right now. He's lifting up one. He's putting down another. It's not just the Christian kings. This is his sovereignty, his providence over the whole world. And so these prophecies are going to trace that control and the accuracy of the word of God. Look at verse, let's dive in. First, the revenge of the north. The revenge of the north, okay? And you can see it in verse 10, and we'll pick up the text. His sons, not Seleucid, remember the second, he returned to his own land at the end of verse 9. Now, it's shocking, hundreds of years before this even took place, the, the, the guy from the north is going to come down to Egypt, but he's going to return defeated. Then the angel in this vision is going to say, his sons will wage war and assemble of mo a multitude of great forces which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through and again shall carry the war as far as his fortress. So what, what's this talking about? His son shall wage war. He's talking about Seleucus III. But Seleucus III was murdered after a three-year reign. And after he was murdered there, and it doesn't say that in 10, but we know that to be true by history, Antiochus, the younger brother of Seleucid III, Antiochus the Great, rose up to power. And he ruled over Syria. You've heard that name, Antiochus the Great. He was 18 at the time of his coronation, and he ruled for 36 years. So Antiochus the Great, of the king of the north, look at the text in verse 10. It says that he shall keep coming and overflow and pass through. Beloved, this is exactly what happened. His Syrian military came with a vengeance just as the prophet predicted. He would overflow and he would pass through. So having secured Seleucid power, Antiochus directed his might against Egypt. And so he captured the port of Seleucia. He seized Tyre and Ptolemais. And like an overflowing flood, he burst through Palestine. This is what happened. He came, look at the end of verse 10. It says, as far as his fortress. 
he came to what is known today as Raphia or Rafa, okay? That's that strip in southwest of Gaza today. This was the revenge of the north. It came from Antiochus the Great. You say, well, what happened? Well, the revenge of the north led secondly to the retaliation of the south. Look at verse 11. Then the king of the south moved with rage shall come out and fight against the king of the north and he shall raise a great multitude but it shall be given into his hand. Who is this? Well, it's the, it says there, the king of the south. Who is that? Well, we look back now we know it's Ptolemy the fourth. Philopater is his, his name. He launched a counterattack against Antiochus. Ptolemy the fourth, or Philopater, it says, was moved with rage. He was very angry what Antiochus had done from the north to capture that, that he's moved with rage. He brings 70,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry, if you will, on horses, and he brought 73 elephants. Now, we know this. It's written in history. Say elephants. Well, they used them as battering rams. And when this battle ended in 2017, Ptolemy IV was victorious over the Syrians, over the kings of the north, and over that area of Palestine. You say, well, why was he victorious? Well, look at the text again in verse 12. It says there at the end of verse 11, it shall be given into his hand. In other words, he was successful because God gave it to Ptolemy to defeat Antiochus. It's what we call a divine passive here. It was given into his hand by God. So he's king, the king of the south, Ptolemy, Philopater. Say, what does he do? Amazingly, look at verse 12. And when the multitude, speaking of the north, is taken away, his heart shall be exalted and he shall cast down tens of thousands, yes, but he shall not prevail. You say, well, what happened? Well, a historian shared this after his victory that Ptolemy, after that victory, gave himself up uh, with an abandon, this is, the prof, this is the history, to a life of luxury and this one historian said with licentiousness. He began to lose the allegiance of his own subjects because of his lifestyle. He was viewed with growing disfavor. And when he failed to press his advantage over Antiochus of Syria, his own people revolted against him. And it was one of the paradoxes of history that Ptolemy was much less if popular, after his successful war against Antiochus than he was before. And so he wins this battle, if you will. The thousands are taken away, but his heart became prideful and he was given into the other hand. So here's the revenge of the north, okay? Here's the retaliation of the south. Thirdly, it's the return of the north. I think you can get the complexity here. Four, verse 13. Now, you did, just remember, this was prophecy when the angel gave it to Daniel. It's stunning. Do you understand why this chapter is attacked? What they want to say is that Daniel didn't write it in the 6th century B.C., Somebody wrote it in the second century BC, or BC, and so therefore it's not prophecy. Whoever wrote in the second century is now just recording history, and then this came about. No, no, no. Daniel is writing before this ever took place. Look at verse 13. For the king of the north, that's Antiochus the Great, shall again rise, raise a multitude greater than the first. And after some years, fascinating, it says that, he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. Here's the return of the north. Because initially Antiochus turned his attention to the east. 
This is where he turned his attention to the, na- to the country of Turkey today. And as he was beginning these other battles after he lost, he was gathering strength and wealth. Then, then, in 2002 BC, after about 15 years, in fact, look at the text again, after about 15 years, because it says in verse 13, after some years, it was after about 15 years, Antiochus the Great invaded the Ptolemaic territory with a huge army to exact his revenge on the south. I know this gets a little bit mind-boggling, but history verifies every detail of these predictions hundreds of years before the events occurred. Now, it's interesting. Look at the text in verse 14. It says there, in those times, many shall rise against the king of the south. So what's he talking about? It wasn't just the Syrian empire going down south against the Ptolemaic prophecy. It says, many shall rise against the kings of the south. In other words, it just isn't Antiochus the Great opposing the king of Egypt, but also a guy who had not even been born, a man by the name of Philip of Macedonia, Those two agreed to weaken the Egyptian territories. And then look at verse 14. And the violent among your own people shall lift themselves up in order, strangely, to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. It says the violent ones amongst your own people. So it's the violent ones in the Old Testament who were murderers and robbers. Among your own people, the text says, who are these? These are apostate Jews who stood by Antiochus uh, against Egypt, I think presumably hoping that they would be granted independence and maybe granted freedom under this impression. You say, why did that happen? Well, look at verse 14. It says, in order, here's the purpose, to fulfill the vision, comma, but they shall fail, okay? In other words, it didn't work. They didn't, they didn't free themselves from Egyptian control at this point, even though they sided with Antiochus. But Antiochus returned. Look at verse 15. This is exactly how it happened. The king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city And the forces of the south shall not stand, or even as best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. Uh, In other words, Antiochus the Great conquered the Egyptian army at a place called Peneus, okay? He took Sidon, did Antiochus the Great. Then he took Patara, And so Ptolemy from the south sent General Scopus to push back the north, but he was defeated by Antiochus. Stunning. Whatever it's stated in scripture happened exactly as the angel said, okay? Ptolemy, even if you look at verse 15, it says he even sent his best troops he sent him to rescue this general called Scopus, but it was too late. The siege of Sidon had reduced the city by famine, and was, Scopus was forced to surrender. And then look at the end of this, verse 15, for there shall be no strength to stand. They couldn't stop Antiochus. So you say, what happened? Look at verse 16. But he... Antiochus the Great, who comes against him, shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his hand. After he wiped out the south, he stood 
in the land of Israel. It was the land bridge, some people called it. Between the fighting of the north and the south and the south and the north is the middle, Jerusalem. And it's just like that today. Antiochus, it says there in verse 16, will do as he wills. He entered into the beautiful land. He entered into that land of Israel with destruction in his hand. History records that he moved a lot, uh, large portions of Jews out of the land. He took the spoils out of the land and he fulfilled prophecies all the way that are confirmed now as we look back at history. You say, well, then what did he do? Well, hundreds of years before it happened, you know what he did? He made a royal alliance. He set up an agreement with Egypt. You say, well, what did he do? It's in the text. Look at it in verse 17. It says there, he shall set his face to come with the strength of the whole kingdom. Now, this is fascinating. And he shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. He shall give him, give him, Ptolemy, the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom. And then it says, but it shall not stand or be to his advantage. Here is a royal alliance. We say, what's he talking about? Well, Antiochus wanted to make a peace agreement. So though he's been warring with Egypt all the time, he wanted to make an agreement with Egypt. And you would wonder, well, why did he do that? And the answer, I think you'll remember, the reason he wanted to come into an agreement and make an arrangement and have a royal alliance is Rome. Rome was not yet a world power, but beloved, it's coming fast. Do you remember in the, the picture of the statue, statue in chapter 2 and chapter 7? It's the fourth kingdom. It was the kingdom of iron. And so to seal this agreement, if you will, he gave his daughter, Antiochus the Great, gave his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemy V as his wife. Now, it's not the t- Cleopatra that you're thinking. I think that was Cleopatra the 13th down the road, okay? But he gave his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemy the fifth as his wife. Why? Because Antiochus wanted to ensure that Egypt would remain loyal, if you will, so a royal marriage was arranged because he wanted them to side with the north and not side with um, Egypt or, or with, uh, yeah, Egypt in the south. You say, well, what happened? I mean, this would be like me writing, hey, in 200 years, this is going to happen. And then there's going to be, you, you know what I'm saying, there's going to happen here. And then this particular president is going to form an alliance. Why? Because he wanted to be friends with Egypt. But look what happened. Look at the end of verse 17. But it shall not stand, okay, whatever that agreement, that marriage, or be to his advantage. You say, well, what happened? It's actually a little humorous. He did that to create a royal alliance so that they would become allies, north and south, because Rome's on the move. But the problem was, Cleopatra loved her Egyptian husband more than she loved her wicked father in the north. He set it up, I think, so that she would stay loyal to him and the north, but she actually loved her Egyptian husband, and the agreement was foiled. This is all fulfilled prophecy. He wrote early, we're looking back. It's exactly what took place. Say, well, what happened next? Look at verse 18. Afterward, okay, that arrangement didn't work. He shall turn his face to the coastlands, and shall capture many of them. Having vanquished the Egyptians, if you will, he turned his attention to the coastlands. What is that? He turned his attention to the Greek islands. He turned his attention to those places in the Mediterranean. And initially, he was successful. You say, why? Because 
Look at the text. It says, he shall capture many of them. So initial success, but it led to this fifth and final prophecy of the Roman victory and the ruin of Antiochus. You say, well, what happened? Well, look at the text. It says in verse 18b, but a commander shall put an end to the, his insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back on him. You say, well, what happened? Well, Rome, as they were beginning to rise on the stage of history, sent ambassadors to confront Antiochus because he was moving back into the Greek islands and Rome was on the the march, if you will, but Antiochus the Great would not listen. So they send an envoy of ambassadors to talk to him. He told Rome that he had every right to recover the lands which had formerly been under the control of Lysimachus and that they were part of Alexander the Great's domain. But here's what happened. In 191 BC, Scipio, do you like that name? Scipio, was sent by the Roman governor to fight against Antiochus the Great. And Rome with their allies routed the Syrians at a place called Thermopylae, okay? And he forced them, that's the north, to withdraw from Greece. Then a few years later, in 188 BC, the Romans then forced Antiochus to sign the treaty of Apania, okay, or Apamia. He was ordered, was Antiochus the Great, to surrender his territory, to surrender his military force, to give one of his sons in this agreement, and to pay heavy taxes, So what happened? Here is the Roman victory and the ruin of Antiochus. You say, well, what took place? Look at verse 19. Then he shall return, it says, turn his face back towards the fortresses of his own land. He goes back. But he shall stumble and fall, and he shall not be found. After he lost that battle... He returned to his own land, the Seleucid Empire up north, and he was defeated, that's what the text says. He was broken, and he was killed. And it's interesting, history says that he was killed robbing a temple in Alimus. In other words, as he's heading back, he had, they put a heavy tax on him, and he went into the temple in this Persian area, and he robbed the temple because he had taxes to pay for all the destruction that he caused in his wars, but he shall not be found. In other words, he died. So, well, then what took place? Look at verse 20. Then, just a soap opera here, isn't it? Fulfilled prophecy. Shall arise in his place one. Now, the Bible is just generic there. His son replaced him. In his place, one shall send an extractor of the tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days, he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. Say, what's this talking about? Antiochus the Great's son, Seleucus the Fourth, Philopater, okay, was forced, okay, after this treaty was made, he was forced to reimburse Rome, as I mentioned, for his father's battle. And and so what did he do? He sent a man by the name of Helidorus, okay, who was the prime minister, who was the tax collector of the Seleucid Empire to seize funds demanded by Rome as part of the Treaty of Apamea. 
Seleucus IV, it says here in verse 20, reigned a few days. Now, it was longer than a few days, but compared to the long run of Antiochus the Great, he reigned a few days and he shall be broken. Now, what's fascinating here is, look at the text. He shall be broken with this son, neither in anger nor in battle. In other words, he was killed, his son, not by an angry mob like his father, or in battle. Heliodorus, uh, the tax collector, (laughs) poisoned the king. He was his own prime minister, go get these taxes, but he's the guy that poisoned the new king that was Antiochus the Great's son. Someone said that there are two things that are certain, death and what? Taxes. But in Daniel 11, there are possibly three things that are certain, death, taxes, and the death by a tax collector. And that's what happened. So beloved, listen, there's the revenge of the north. Then there's the retaliation of the south. Then there's the return of the north. Then there's a royal alliance. Then there's a Roman victory and the ruin of Antiochus the Great. What's a few takeaways? What, what, What can we take from this? Thank you for being faithful to be a noble Berean here. Maybe two takeaways. Number one, I would just say the power of the scripture. The power of the scripture. The word of God shall never fail to come to pass exactly as it was revealed. Or positively, exactly what was foretold is exactly what was described. I mean, here is, what other book does that? Here is the supernatural origin of the word of God. Prophecy fulfilled 150 years in advance from about 373 BC to 175 BC. Or was it just a coincidence that Babylon sacked Jerusalem? Was it just a coincidence that Persia rose to power? Was it just a coincidence that Alexander the Great came in power? Was it just a coincidence that after he rose, his kingdom was divided into four kingdoms? Is it just a coincidence that a series of, you know, a series of kings of the north and kings of the south would, comp- would compete over the peace of the land called Israel and fight back and forth? Oh no, you're holding in your hand the power of the word of God. Beloved, you hold in your hand, women, men, singles, the word of God that is breathed out by God. It's inspired by God. It's infallible. It is not, it does not have any errors in it. It is inerrant in all that it states. Here's a scripture for you in Isaiah 46. Remember the former things of old, God is speaking, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no other like me, declaring the end from the beginning. My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, he says, which would be, Cyrus, amazing. The man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I, it says there, will do it. Whatever God's word has stated, it is always true. Do you ever meet people who just say, well, the Bible's filled with errors over the years? Many people have said that to me and I say, can you show me? Well, I really don't have one, but I know it is. And I say, no, it's not. 
There's not one error in it. There's nothing ever, there's been no historical artifact that has disproved the Bible. Every time we find more manuscripts, they affirm the accuracy, the timetable of the scripture. Why? Because it's the very breath of God. Isaiah 48, three says, the former things I declared of old, they went out from my mouth. I announced them, then suddenly I did them and they came to pass. Isaiah 48, 5, I declared them to you from of of old before they came to pass, I announced them to you. Listen, here's the power of the word of God. So that's one. Second takeaway is the providence of God in all history. In all history. Go back to Daniel chapter two. Obviously, we've been studying this for a little bit, but you remember in Daniel two, in verse 21, it says there, he changes times and seasons. How about this? He removes kings, sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Look down at chapter two, verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. That's the coming kingdom of God, praise the Lord. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Oh, beloved, there's coming a kingdom where Jesus Christ will rule and reign in righteousness, amen? I mean, we're just looking at the soap opera of the north and the south, but listen, when he comes, he's gonna rule and reign in righteousness and holiness and justice and purity, and it's gonna be a wonderful day. Look over at Daniel chapter four. Remember at the end of that great chapter with Nebuchadnezzar. It says in chapter four, in verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. My reason returned to me. I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are as counted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him what have you done I mean this is just the truth of his coming kingdom it says in Revelation 1 5 that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness he's the firstborn of the dead and it says of Christ he's the ruler of the kings on the earth amen I mean, if you're looking for contentment in our world today, no. The only contentment comes when our sights are set on the future. We've entered that kingdom by being born again, but there is a coming kingdom of God and Christ's name in Revelation 1-5 is the ruler of the kings of the earth and all the developments today are steps to a decisive triumph. In fact, in Revelation 17, 4, they will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is the Lord of lords and the king of what? Kings. This is our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. At his second coming in Revelation 19, 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and what? Lord of Lords. In fact, it says in the book of Zechariah chapter 14, I take this literally and physically, that the Lord will be king over all the earth. And what's incredible, beloved, here is that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but he died in your place to grant you the forgiveness of sins, amen? I mean, the King of kings and the Lord of lords died in your place as we come into communion. God shows his love for us and that while we were still yet sinners, what? Christ died for us. 
that glorious king died in your place, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, having nailed it to the cross.